The damning parting shot of a Goldman Sachs executive has raised serious questions once again over the practices of the financial industry. Has Wall Street simply shrugged off the 2008 crisis to maximize profits and the risk to the rest of us? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansi. It's true that Wall Street executives come and go, but it's the manner of the latest high-profile exit that's made many sit up and take notice. In an open resignation letter in the New York Times, the former Goldman Sachs executive, Greg Smith, decried what he called the toxic and destructive working environment at the firm. He said that workers at the investment bank were focused on milking clients for all that they could, and that staff often talked about, quote, ripping clients off. The investment bank was heavily penalized for selling toxic mortgages to investors leading up to the financial crisis of 2008. It also received money from the U.S. government's subsequent multi-billion dollar bank bailout. Smith's damning resignation letter came just a day after so-called bank stress tests revealed that financial firms were generally in fine health following their brush with disaster. But his comments have made many wonder if Goldman Sachs and the industry as a whole have learned any lessons from the 2008 crisis and change their ways. And as long as the US government is so reliant on the Wall Street firms it means to regulate, can meaningful reform occur? Or is there a need instead for a radical reordering of the entire global financial system? So, has Wall Street become too big to reform? With me to discuss this in the studio is economist John Burlaw from the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Next to him, Marcus Stanley from Americans for Financial Reform. And from New York, Reuters financial journalist Felix Salmon. Felix Salmon, first of all, do you think this is a significant moment both for Goldman Sachs and the industry as a whole? No, I don't. It's causing a huge amount of heat and, frankly, very little light. I, I think that the in a new cycle or two's time, we'll have forgotten all about Greg Smith. And frankly, none of us really knew who he was in the first place. Anyway, he didn't have any employees. He was in a pretty low-level position within Goldman Sachs, hidden away in London, trading U.S. equity derivatives. And although his, his op-ed in the New York Times made a big splash, it didn't say anything that we haven't heard a hundred times before. And John Berlow... It was true. John Berlow, though, that, I mean, that is the kind of the backlash that we're hearing the morning after. after you know, yesterday, of course, $2 billion were wiped off Goldman uh, Sachs's share prices, but, but they are rallying it again. Uh, but nonetheless, though, is it not so much who he is uh, and, you know, and, and whether the news cycles move on as opposed to the, the sort of insights he gave and whether the clients of Goldman Sachs move on, perhaps? Well, what he wrote clearly struck a, struck a chord, and uh, I hold no special sympathy for Goldman Sachs. I'm all about startups, new firms, emerging growth firms, and lifting the regulatory barriers that keep them down rather than the big companies that are intended to like Goldman Sachs. I think having, this, having said that, I agree with Felix that there was very little specific revealed other than the fact that they called their clients Muppets. He, he said that they ripped off their clients but really didn't give specific examples as to how and he had the disclaimer that he didn't see anything illegal. So I mean the clients he was talking about also I think it's significant are not small mostly I assume not small investors but big institutional investors and millionaires and billionaires themselves who were sort of fully capable of taking care of themselves. If they really thought they would be get, getting a bad deal they would be leaving there Drugs. Let's remind ourselves of some of what Greg Smith had to say in the New York Times. Uh, here are some, some choice quotes. Quote, the interests of the client continue to be sidelined in the way the firm operates and thinks about making money. Smith went on, it makes me ill how callously people talk about ripping their clients off over the last 12 months. I've seen five different managing directors refer to their own clients as, quote, Muppets sometimes over internal email. Marcus Stanley, again, we're hearing this, you know, this is nothing new. Of course, Congress exhaustively went through mm -hmm. uh, some of the rather dodgy dealings of Goldman Sachs. Matt Taibbi mm -hmm. in The Rolling Stone has been pretty forensic, calling Goldman Sachs famously the, the great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity. But, but I suppose what people are wondering about the significance of this letter is those sorts of exposés and, and in government 
uh, exposés don't seem to be making any difference. It's when insiders on Wall Street start saying this stuff that perhaps you might see some sort of change. Well, I think what is so powerful about what he said is that is exactly that it confirms what all these other studies have found, what the 2010 hearings from the Senate Permanent Committee on Investigations found, that when they subpoenaed you know, tens of thousands of emails from Goldman Sachs and traced out exactly and precisely how Goldman Sachs was ripping off his clients in just the ways that he described. So that's really where the specifics that John referred to uh, live. And what's so significant about it is that we, in, in the Dodd-Frank Act, we passed legislation that was very specifically aimed at exactly these problems. Uh, most prominently the Volcker Rule, but there are also other elements within U.S. financial reform that are aimed at this. And right now we're seeing a tidal wave of industry lobbying in Washington that's saying, no, this is not needed, this is excessive. And I think that it, it reminds people of exactly why these laws were passed and how important it is to implement Let's them. Let's go back to basics then briefly, mm -hmm. first of all. John Burlaw, mm -hmm. perhaps you should explain what exactly Goldman Sachs does, first of all, and how it affects all of us. Goldman Sachs uh, is, uh, is, a Wall, is a Wall Street investment bank. It, uh, it, it was involved with, say, bringing in the Facebook IPO and some of the, the trading and uh, additional capital for Facebook. And it has been uh, um, an, an investment bank uh, for, uh, for the several, several decades, one of the leading firms on, uh, on Wall Street. And it is, it is, it's also unique in the sense that so many of its officials have gone on to government jobs, such as Hank Paulson in the Bush administration and uh, Bob Rubin in the Clinton administration. And, and we'll get on to that a bit called later. Government. But how, and, and, how, how, and, how integral is, before we get on to that, in here and, Felix, I mean, how, yeah, integral, of, how integral is all this to the global economy? As I suppose. We'll get on to some of those issues in a second, but how integral is Goldman Sachs to the global economy? Well, I think it does. I think no one else, it's integral to the global economy. I mean, I think there are a lot of, if it went away tomorrow, a lot of other firms could do what it does and take its place, particularly if, if you get rid of some of the red tape or some of the smaller investment banks. But I think it's been integral and tied in because of some of so many of its contacts going, going, to, the, going to the government and has been called Government Sachs. It was able, with the American International Group's bailout, it turned out to be the biggest beneficiary since it was its largest creditor. So I think that's where some of the distrust is the, the connection it has with government and with the state, and it just seems to get bigger every time we pass a so-called financial reform. But this is also why, why, why around the world, I suppose, we're all involved in this, because, again, the Greek economy is a good example. They, I mean, they, they advised the Greek government mm -hmm. on, on various ways to sideline um, Eurozone regulations, and, of course, that led to, to disaster. And I guess that's, that's the point, then, um, Felix, um, that in, in practice, they, what, we're, what, we, what we found out over the last few years, really, um, is that, they're, that they're, many of their practices are rather dodgy. And in this latest, this latest article by Greg Smith, he talks about what they do in practice, unloading axes, hunting elephants, uh, trading in any illiquid, opaque product with a two-letter acronym. Perhaps you can help us understand what some of those, those terms mean and what they do in practice that, that has become so, so destructive. Right. So this is, this is the, what's known as the broker-dealer arm of Goldman Sachs. And I want to get back to exactly what Greg Smith did, because this is quite important. He was on the desk trading what's known as equity derivatives. You don't, really, don't worry about the equity side. The derivative side means that it's a zero-sum game. What you have is you have big clients, um, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, that kind of thing. And for whatever risk management purposes of their own, they want to buy some derivatives products. So they go to Goldman Sachs, or Goldman Sachs comes to them selling products, and they, and they agree on a price. And the important thing to remember here is that you can, in the, all derivatives in the world, if you add them all up, the, the net value of all of those derivatives is zero. Um, they're not like stocks, they're not like bonds, which have intrinsic value. Derivatives are, are, by definition, a zero-sum game. And if Goldman Sachs is selling you a derivative, then you know that Goldman Sachs is making money off, off that trade and is taking the other side of that trade. So every single one of Goldman Sachs' clients, every single one of Greg Smith's clients knew this. And they all approach Goldman Sachs in the knowledge that they're trying uh, Felix, to Felix, I think you jumped ahead I, I, a bit I there. I want to really need, disagree yeah, with that. Yeah, you jumped ahead as well, because Marcus, Marcus of, Sonny, yeah. first of all, I mean, I think that was rather an interesting, that was a preemptive mm -hmm. strike, perhaps, because mm -hmm. the, the charge is, though, that when they're selling these derivatives to their clients, mm -hmm. um, it's usually the worst things that, Gold, that the Goldman Sachs owns. Uh, they, they pass it off 
to their clients with a Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. uh, stamp of approval, and then Goldman Sachs bets against it and makes a fortune mm -hmm. when these things go bust, right? Well, in the case of the the Abacus securitization, that was exactly what happened. That that is is not necessarily there were derivatives involved with that securitization. Um, but in that case, the clients were, were actually were betting on what would happen to some of the debt instruments within that securitization. And I also want to point out that derivatives are sold to clients as insurance product. So in the same way that when someone sells you insurance, uh, you know, your insurance company will gain if, uh, if you pay, pay premiums and your house doesn't burn down, but you're getting something of value from your insurance company. And we just saw the largest municipal bankruptcy in United States history, Jefferson County in Alabama, which was brought down by derivatives contracts that were not needed by that county, not needed at all, but they were sold as being in the interests of that county as a form of a way to get free these, money. These are, these are just normal this people. This is ordinary line, right? taxpayers. Right. This is this is building a new sewer for Jefferson County, and these were these were Wall Street derivatives that brought that county down. And that's the charge so then, which the again is nothing new. This. It's nothing new, uh, John Berla, but the, the, the charge then is there's a business model here, which is for Goldman Sachs and other banks and institutions to simply create bubbles of dubious value um, uh, and make a huge profit doing that, bet against those uh, dubious bubbles, uh, make a huge fortune when those bubbles burst, and then begin the cycle again. I mean, do you think that's being unfair? Yes, I do, in that sense. I mean, no, because uh, on, on derivatives the, of themselves, I mean, it was Jefferson County, the officials there have some responsibility. It was poor financial management and uh, with the derivatives and other things that brought that county down. They could have also, there are many ways to go bankrupt. You could buy stocks, you could have bought Lehman Brothers that go bust. Airlines and, and manufacturers use derivatives all the time to hedge uh, inflation, to hedge oil prices. Southwest Airlines was successful in buying. Uh, right, but there's a sense of trust about this. And, and, and we want to know whether that sense of trust, especially with this letter again from an insider, it has finally and irrevocably, fine, you know, is going to is going to dissipate. Felix Salmon, you you were then suggesting clients go into these transactions knowingly, but you have to wonder as more and more revelations no, no, come I, out. I, I, I don't think they do. I think I think. Why Jackson do the Muppets County return a though? Yeah. I, I think I think I think that this is this is absolutely key. Jefferson County is an example of. Goldman Sachs basically taking unsophisticated investors, selling them derivatives products that they don't need and are quite harmful, pocketing a lot of money, and then letting the investor lose lots of money. And I think that this is what Greg Smith was complaining about, is that investment banks, because they're taking the other side of these trades, they're incentivized to do what are fundamentally really bad deals for the end user, for their clients, but because the worst it is for the client, the more money. But isn't make. the implication that it's not and just the small investors and, and these Jefferson County that, that's, that, that are being duped, but it you actually is the big to investors too, though? to be unsophisticated. Right. This is oh, that's what you mean. Okay. He was right. talking about how his investors had trillions of dollars, but these sovereign wealth funds, there were the, you know, the German banks like IKB, which mm -hmm. was on the wrong side of the... Yeah, um, I mean, they're all out of this business. These are very, very large investors, but just because you're large doesn't mean you're sophisticated. But again, that's why we're wondering whether this is another turning point. Perhaps this might be a real turning point because, again, it's the insiders saying it now. Look, we have been duping you, and maybe it's time that maybe finally then the Muppets won't keep coming back. The Muppets, they will keep coming back, sadly. I, you know, no matter how many times these things are revealed, the clients are all... The, the, the banks are really good at flattering the clients and saying, oh my God, you're so sophisticated, you're brilliant. And the clients believe the flattery and they go into these deals time and time again. The interesting thing about Greg Smith's uh, letter though was he seemed to suggest there was once a golden age where it wasn't simply about making profit and profiting off your clients, perhaps in a rather unscrupulous way. He, I, what did he talk about? He talked about a golden age when there was integrity, humility and doing right. Is that an accurate? Is that an accurate assessment? Was there a time where once it wasn't quite as bad as it is now, John Berlow? That That's an accurate description of what Goldman Sachs was selling and still actually does sell even today. Felix, I'm just a second. Long-term greedy. And right, so they, that and was the they, point. There was long-term greed as opposed to short-term right. greed. I mean, was that actually was, was that how it used to be then, perhaps? Which is a bit, at least a bit more beneficial for the client. Well, I... It, it used to, it hang, used on, to Felix, like hang on, Felix. Hang on, Felix. I can't speak. I was of course, on, on Goldman Sachs culture specifically. I, I wasn't there. But I, in a way, Mr. Smith's letter or essay is not that unusual. People uh, uh, become disenchanted with a corporate culture and, you know, uh, f fight back in, in, their, in their own ways. A lot of times it's just um, 
to by starting by starting their own business with which is a better corporate culture, you know, as in the movie Jerry Maguire, or as in when Bill Gates and Steve Jobs didn't want to join IBM. So it's more of an issue of you know the ability for star uh, for startups, say the ability for startups to go public when they're now choked by uh, which even the o Obama administration agrees they're choked by laws like the Sarbanes Oxley Act of 2002, and and Congress is actually having a jumpstart our business startups to loosen some of the regulatory barriers for them. Having the ability for people like Mr. Smith, bright guys and gals, to start their own to challenge the dominant corporate culture. Well, I suppose I mean that's that, that's interesting. I mean, th th there are some who point to a specific moment in history where things started to change, and we have a quote from um, the current CEO of Goldman Sachs, uh, Lloyd, Lloyd Blankfein, he was speaking in 2010. He, he was describing what he thought was the secret behind Goldman Sachs, and perhaps he did put his finger on it. The people, we get a kind of person at Goldman Sachs who really wants to be an influential person, who wants to do something that's important, who feels that the we want job... to make a lot of money and then go out and do good. You know something? The people that we have don't would like to do well for themselves also do but well. most of them at the height of their careers go into public service and the question is whether that is the key the company's employees do go on uh, to public service and as a result they influence u.s monetary policy robert rubin served as treasury secretary under president bill clinton after spending 26 years at goldman sachs as a board member and co-chairman George W. Bush's Treasury Secretary was Henry Paulson, Hank Paulson, a former chief executive at Goldman, who started with the company in 1974. On the same day that Barack Obama's Treasury Secretary, Tim Geithner, announced new rules to reduce the influence of lobbyists, the president named a former Goldman Sachs lobbyist as Geithner's chief of staff. And Marcus Stanley, the question is, it was when, at that moment, I don't know whether it's oversimplifying, but when Robert Rubin got into, uh, became Clinton's um, became very close to Clinton as an economic advisor. Un there was unleashed an enormous amount of deregulation, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly that's the culture of giving the banks pretty much carte blanche yep. seems to begin from there. And the question is whether that is what changed Goldman Sachs and other bankers from thinking about long-term greed to just pure short-term profit, bottom line, and so forth, and has resulted in the disaster that we're in. Well, I do think that distinction between long-term greed and short-term greed is absolutely critical, not just to understanding Goldman Sachs, but understanding where we're at with Wall Street and the financial sector uh, in general. And what happened with, with that deregulation is we, we really tore down firewalls that used to exist between the culture of banking and the culture of trading. And trading is a culture of, of short-term greed. Um, where, you, you know, your profits, your transactions can be measured in seconds, uh, where a couple of days is a long time, where you can take down profits and, you know, leave with those profits long before anything goes wrong with the instruments that you sold. And it's very different than the culture of long-term investment and banking, which is also, you know, greed is inherent in, in the free market system, as I'm sure John is ready to step in and tell us. Uh, but but that is it's there. Greed different. is good. No, we weren't going to that. that whole <laughs> and, thing, and, they're really and different kinds Ruben. of greed. It, it's worth mentioning mm -hmm. that Ruben was the first trader to run Goldman Sachs, as mm -hmm. opposed to a banker. Mm -hmm. And since then, everyone who's run Goldman Sachs since Ruben has been a trader and not a banker. So is that why then it, it's often said that nothing really has changed since two thousand two thousand and eight because the the giant squid of, of Goldman Sachs and, and other you know, uh, uh, other financial institutions still have their tentacles around government. Actually, to such an extent that in this election season, in fact, uh, and I think we have one of the adverts, right-wing super political action committees are using that sort of thing against President Obama. We have one advert now, actually. I did not run for office to be helping out a bunch of you know, fat cat bankers on Wall Street. But guess who gave $42 million to Obama's last campaign for president? Wall Street bankers and financial insiders, more than any other candidate in history. Helping out a bunch of you know, fat cat bankers on Wall Street. But Obama voted for the Wall Street bailout. Fat cat bankers on Wall Street. But his White House is full of Wall Street executives. His first chief of staff, his next chief of staff, former military office director, foreign intelligence, ambassador to Germany, treasury secretary. I mean, the question is then, Marcus Stanley, is that why, uh, as you've already alluded to, a lot of these regulations that have been talked about and indeed, you know, passed, mm -hmm. aren't, really, uh, aren't really bearing fruit? Or, they don't seem to be doing much. Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs and all these, they're still bundling and finding new exotic ways to make the short-term 
profit but with enormous with this with exactly the same calamitous risk that we're, that we're suffering from, from, from since 2008 well you certainly won't see any argument from me that there's far too much influence of the financial sector in our political system and that's bipartisan it goes across both parties but I, I think it's somewhat hypocritical uh, t for people to be saying that this is all about Obama's influence when you have the Republican Party trying to repeal the entire Dodd-Frank Act. And uh, when they're not trying to repeal it, they're trying to put enormous loopholes in it that, as you say, will uh, permit the continuation of those kind of risks. Look, we're, we're in the process. There are some really significant legislative steps in the Dodd-Frank Act uh, that if they were implemented the right way and if they were implemented strongly, really could uh, create systemic change in some of these. I mean, they could get Goldman Sachs out of a lot of these businesses that Greg Smith was complaining about that they're ripping their, their clients off but, on. But, but, in the so. out, but that's, that's, there still seems to be mm -hmm. some way to go for, for government action. It, Greg mm -hmm. Smith, at, 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 in his letter, seemed to suggest, well, now it's time for the board of directors to take action and so forth. Do you think there's any likelihood of that, uh, John Berlow? Uh, uh, that's up. That's up to the board of directors and Goldman and Goldman Sachs shareholders. I think. I think probably. I mean, yes, they would. I think they would like probably, and some of them would like a corporate culture more like Apple, where at the very least, where employees they? believe believe in the. I think there are probably a, a lot of shareholders who who would. But let me just just say. I mean, Goldman Sachs <laughs> passed the stress test. Um, uh, I mean, with flying colors, just the day before Greg Smith did. Whereas at the same time, you had a regional bank like SunTrust. Based in Atlanta struggling with this. They have, they've been struggling with things from, from Dodd-Frank, like the price controls on debit cards, which benefit big retailers. You're, you're making lost their, their revenue. The retail banks so, are much so, better, you're saying. So, the, um, so, so Goldman, I mean, the big guys have more money to comply with the regulations, I, to find loopholes and, and, and other things. And um, We're running out of time, and then there are two really important points. First of all, Felix Salmon, then, do you think that, that the board of directors will take action, just, just in a, very, very quickly? There's, there's zero chance. The board of directors has essentially zero control over what happens in Goldman Sachs. But what we do know for a fact is that it has a balance sheet of almost a trillion dollars and that it makes substantially all of its money from trading, from short-term greedy traders rather than long-term greedy bankers. Marcus Stanley, if you have then, that much equity built up in the company, then that's where you're going to make your money. And so they're going to continue to, to encourage their traders to rip off their clients if that is a profitable business to be in. All right, now, now, now we're getting to that tricky point where we have two minutes and we've got to really get to some, some really fundamental solutions. But Marcus <laughs> Stanley, then, what hope is there then for change? Is there an alternative model that would lead uh, to a lot less risk uh, is it possible to achieve? It just doesn't two minutes. I think or if, maybe less. If, if we pass the kind of, if, if the regulators put in place the kind of strong Volcker rule that they should put in place, then I think uh, Goldman Sachs, if it wants to stay in these trading businesses, would have to give up its bank holding company uh, status and have to step outside of, of the public safety net to some degree. And I think that would be. And is that a, likely a to happen anytime step. soon, though? Um, I, I think you could see that, that happening within the next two years. Felix? Goldman Sachs would love to, to, to give up its, it, its, its bank holding company status and go back to how it was before, much less regulated and free to charge as much as it wants for its equity derivatives. It wouldn't change a thing except for it would mean less regulation. So what's the answer, Felix? The answer is to move to exchange traded derivatives rather than over the counter derivatives, which, are, which have much less um, transparent pricing. I, I agree with Felix on that uh, also, by the way. That's another very important regulatory step. Is there any way that because Goldman Sachs and these other banks ha have, the, have such a control over the economy, the giant squid has its tentacles so firmly over the economy, that they're worried that if there were any of these changes to happen, that there might be some really short-term consequences that might be pretty terrible. Is, is, that, is that part of the, the equation for the government and other people who, are, who, are, who at least who know what the right thing is but aren't, don't seem to be acting very quickly? Uh, well, well, certainly I think that's one of the things that the banks say to them in the back room, you know, what's going to happen to our profits if we can't earn enormous margins on our clients. But I, I don't think that's, that's realistic. I think with the, with, with the derivatives issues that Felix pointed to, um, that's going to be money out of Goldman Sachs' pockets, but money back to their clients because they, these, these spreads aren't going to be earned anymore and there's going to be much more transparency and the market is going to be function better. And with the Volcker rule, we have two years to implement but, that. But so. uh, is in conclusion, though, Felix, I mean, do we need Goldman Sachs? I mean, what do they contribute to the economy? Is there even any need for any of these institutions, frankly? It's true. These are very large institutions, very profitable institutions with 
essentially zero social value. If they disappeared overnight, I think the world would probably be a better rather than a worse place. I think they will leave it. Felix Salmon in New York, thank you very much. John Verlau, thank you. Verlau, rather, thank you very much. Marcus Stanley, thank, thank, you. thank you. And that's all from the Inside Story team in Washington, D.C. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AljaZero.net.